Gas prices soared to new highs this week. In fact, the average price of fuel surpassed the 2008 record, making it the most expensive in U.S. history. Rising inflation, coupled with the conflict in Ukraine, has been driving up this cost. As gas nears $10 a gallon, Biden is facing renewed pressure to ramp up oil and gas production to help cash-strapped Americans. Lee Harris is a writing fellow for the American Prospect in her newly published piece titled Frackers Restrict the Flow, Raise the Price. She dives into how frackers and Wall Street are fueling this crisis, and she's with us now. Welcome to the show. So tell us uh, from, you know, a lot of people will say, well, no, it's just there's other things that are causing the rising prices of gas. Like from your perspective, what is it exactly? Yeah, so we've looked at this and obviously everyone knows that you're paying more at the pump and, and Americans are feeling that day to day. But that money is going to oil companies who are then keeping the, private, the, the higher profits and in fact, returning it to shareholders in the form of dividends and stock buybacks. And they're doing that rather than ramping up investment. So essentially, this is a direct transfer of money from American households to oil companies' pockets. Right. But so let's get to the question of whether or not this is a rational decision. So you have a lot of people who watch the industry very closely. You, know, you have people that don't watch the industry closely, like Fox News, who will say, just drill, baby, drill, and then prices will go down. But then you have people who are either involved with the industry or watch it closely and say, actually, you know, it's, it's not profitable to invest in shale gas, for instance. And that's the reason uh, that you're not seeing investment from Wall Street. Wall, Wall Street is fine to lose money for some certain amount of time, but eventually, after losing money year after year after year, they're going to say, you know what, We're, we, don't, we don't trust this industry to actually be profitable. So where, where, is, the, where is the balance to you? Is, is, is there profitable investment you know, at, say, $100 a barrel or, or less uh, in the kind of fracking industry? Yeah, well, so you need a little historical context to think about this. So there's been this kind of long running fight during the shale boom between big oil and small frackers. And of course, I say small frackers, but the wildcat frackers aren't exactly small. They're mostly owned by billionaires with like minor kingdoms in North Dakota, but still relatively small frackers. And it's been tough for big oil to keep them in line. So basically for years, um, they lived beyond their means. They got major cash infusions from Wall Street kind of because they were selling this story of energy independence and of a really exciting, booming new industry. And every time oil prices went up, frackers that had been living beyond their means and going deeply into debt would increase their production immediately. And the oil majors didn't really like that. They were kind of like, why can't you wait till the prices rise a little more and then we'll all feast. But the oil majors really struggled to impose much capital discipline on them. Uh, and by the way, big oil has the same problem with OPEC, right? Like it's tough to cartelize this this industry. Um, and that's why oil prices were forever stuck in this kind of shale band. Now, oil investors didn't like those low returns. And, um, and after each run up and crash, they complained. Um, and so uh, and, and it was really regional banks and kind of small investors that got burned each time. But eventually, Wall Street investors wanted to see higher profits, too, like you're saying. So. What's happened very recently is with the series of mergers and, and all the consolidation that picked up during during the coronavirus shutdown, uh, they seem to have finally figured out how to impose capital discipline. Um, there are fewer players and, and they're a little bigger. And now that profits are finally soaring, now that Americans are paying more for oil and gas, investors want to see those profits after years of, uh, of really shoddy returns. They want it returned to them in the form of dividends. So what that means right now is well, a new report from this think tank Commonwealth. They analyzed data from Bloomberg and they found that since 2015, the big five U.S. oil companies have paid out 201 billion around that to investors in the form of dividends and share buybacks. And meanwhile, they've actually paid negative domestic taxes. And, and so to put a point on it. Yeah. You know, the Fox News crowd will say we need to drill more so that we can push down the price. But if you push down the price, they stop drilling because it's no longer profitable. Isn't that right? Yeah, that's basically right. Um, some people call it so a capital So what they're strike. calling for just wouldn't actually work if it worked. Like on its own I terms. I think that's right. Now, um, now, I think it's telling that this has largely been a fight between Wall Street investors and oil companies. 
um, the administration hasn't really gotten involved at a time when he's pushing, putting pressure. You know, the Biden administration is putting pressure on a whole lot of powerful lobbies. He hasn't really pushed on Wall Street uh, to invest further in, in shale oil. Now, that might be for any number of reasons, like um, uh, like a desire to invest more in clean energy. But that hasn't happened very much yet either. So right now it's interesting. So I, I, I mentioned um, the the kind of elevated profits that oil companies are seeing um, amid not paying domestic taxes. And in fact, um, just the detail on that is that um, the big five oil companies got around 1.95 billion back in domestic taxes between 2015 and 2022. So that's negative domestic taxes. And over the same period, they paid around 77 billion to foreign governments. Uh, so I think now some lawmakers are starting to ask, why shouldn't the government claw back some of those subsidies uh, that they've been paying into industry that American taxpayers have been paying? And um, Senator Whitehouse and, and Ro Khanna and a couple of others just introduced a proposal to do that. Um, it would be a, a, a tax on the excess profits that oil companies are making right now. So it kind of proposes to claw back the additional revenue that they're seeing or some amount of it and put it back in Americans' pocketbooks. White House press corps, the White House press corps put Press Secretary Jen Psaki on the spot yesterday about the gas debacle and the White House pushing electric vehicles. Let's listen to that. This is a president who always talks about the power of our example. Mm -hmm. Does he own an electric vehicle? Presidents of the United States don't do a lot of driving. He's posted videos where he's revving the engine of his Corvette in Wilmington. He owns cars. And he also has driven electric vehicles as president, mm -hmm. as, as to give a model to the rest of the country. Does he own one? I think the president's record on this is clear, Peter. Presidents of the United States, current, and when they are no longer, typically are not doing a lot of driving. <laughs> Which I guess is true. But, you know, it is interesting. It's not like all Americans can just go out and buy a Tesla today and that would solve this problem. Like, a lot of people can't do that. So why, why do you think the administration it keeps harping on the electric vehicle? Yeah, maybe it comes off as a little elitist. I mean, there... I Definitely that clip does. Um, there's a lot of talk about how there are no sh immediate short term solutions to this problem. And it's true, like we haven't invested in either dirty energy or clean energy. So it's tough to immediately ramp up any kind of uh, new energy. But something like a cash for clunkers program where the government pays you to trade in your your old vehicle for um, a new EV could be rolled out immediately. But I hear you. It's uh, it's an elitist response from the administration. The other thing to consider, though, is that we've been using um, the Defense Production Act for a number of things like masks and vaccines. There's this new proposal that the White House is apparently considering to help our allies in Europe, uh, which is obviously a key reason that gas prices are going up, um, where it, I think Bill McKibben has nicknamed it heat pumps for peace. But basically, like, um, we've sent, you know, we've sent Europe in the past packets of milk and food and, and, and other supplies during during crises. Uh, we could easily be sending them clean energy investment and, and uh, invest, investing in bringing down the price of, uh, of fuel for Europeans. So that's something the White House is considering. Hmm. I'm picturing heat pumps being airlifted into Europe. <laughs> That's the plan. Or electric vehicles. Parachute, parashuting the heat. The heat yeah. comes in. Right. Like, oh, they have no idea where to plug screws. in their cars. Or, you know. We need a no drive zone, only electric cars. Parachute in the geothermal. Right. I like it. <laughs> I guess we've solved the Ukraine it. war. Just yeah. like that. Let's do it. Well, Lee, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks so much, Ryan. Great reporting. And we'll have more rising right after this. <laughs> 